Ken Yalls obtained his law degree from Osgoode Hall in Toronto and was called to the bar in 1978. He practices law in Mississauga with the firm of Pallet, Vallow, Barsky and Hutchison and his practice is largely restricted to the power of sale and foreclosure uh, mortgage remedies. I introduce to you Ken Yalls. I propose in the half an hour allocated to me to deal only with uh, the form and content of notice of sale and uh, persons to be served. Although the specific power of sale is generally set out in the uh, mortgage contract, uh, the exercise of the power of sale must be carried out in conformity with Part 3. Uh, the first section of Part 3 of the Act is Section 30, Subsection 1, which provides that a mortgagee shall not exercise a power in sale unless a notice of exercising the power of sale in Form 1 has been given. I'm sure you've all seen Form 1. Uh, Form 1 requires certain specific information uh, to be included in the notice. Firstly, Form 1 requires that the mortgage be identified. In this uh, regard, the case law suggests that a misdescription of the mortgage in the notice, which nevertheless allows the person receiving it to identify the mortgage and which does not uh, confuse or mislead him, will not invalidate the notice. I, I refer in my paper uh, to the case of Kenny and Barnard where the registration date uh, was incorrectly set out in the notice. In all other respects, uh, the mortgage is properly described and the court held that as the parties receiving it would not be confused, the notice was valid. In the case of uh, Monroe and Page Developments, however, the court distinguished between misstatements of detail and misstatements of the mortgage itself. In that case, the notice properly set out the amount claimed under the mortgage under which the mortgagee was proceeding but incorrectly described another previously discharged mortgage. And uh, the court commented that although the mortgagor was not misled, the notice was obviously issued for the benefit of subsequent encumbrances as well, and because it was misleading or confusing on its face, it was invalid. Form 1 also requires that the property be described. Now, in the case of Re Kutalakis Naren, which I cite in my paper, uh, that notice set out a lot and plan description but failed to include the uh, more detailed meets and bounds description. Uh, the court noted that Form 1 only required that the mortgage property be described, and as it did not require uh, a detailed legal description, uh, the notice was held to be valid. Form 1, of course, requires the mortgagee to set out uh, the amount claimed for principal interest and costs, and of course, failure to do so will invalidate the notice. Uh, it also requires, however, that where there are other disbursements uh, that have been made, that these also be set out. Uh, in the case of Repratis Investments Limited and Ontario Mortgage Corporation, which is a case I unfortunately appeared, upon, appeared on, uh, the notice uh, claimed common expense arrears. However, these were hidden in the principal. They weren't separately set out, and Mr. Justice Everly held the notice was invalid. Uh, now, it is often the case uh, when dealing with institutions that uh, some of their disbursements are in hidden in principle and you may have uh, no knowledge of them whatever. I would suggest that uh, you communicate with your client and, and make sure that they uh, haven't made any of these disbursements that they haven't separately set out. I refer in my paper uh, to two cases of Sherry Owen Jackson and Reeve Friedman where the amount claimed as set out in the notice uh, exceeded the amount actually owing under the mortgage in both cases by approximately $100. Uh, surprising it or not, the court held that that was not uh, such a substantial difference that the notice should be held invalid, and accordingly, uh, the notices were held to be valid. Now, it is, it's clear that the validity or invalidity of the, of the notice will depend upon the, the extent of the discrepancy between the balance owing as stated in the notice and the actual balance outstanding uh, under the mortgage. However, uh, it's clear that the range of acceptable error will probably never uh, be determined with any exactitude by the courts. Uh, you can appreciate the uh, practical difficulties of, of the court doing that. Form 1 uh, also requires that the mortgagee be identified. I state that uh, if the mortgagee is not an original party to the contract, uh, the manner in which he obtained his interest should be set out in the notice, uh, be it by way of amalgamation, change of name, assignment, whatever. Uh, there has no, been no case uh, decided upon whether the failure to do that will invalidate the notice. 
It's only since 1977, uh, believe it or not, uh, that it, it was decided by the Court of Appeal that a mortgagee solicitor may sign the notice on the mortgagee's behalf. That's the Larch, Larchwood Construction Company case cited in my paper. The case of Reese Alcissi and Reed uh, stands for the proper proposition that notwithstanding that a mortgagee solicitor can sign on behalf of the mortgagee, the notice must specify the capacity in which he is signing or the notice will be invalid. Finally, the often discussed case of Reed, Bodiak and Collison uh, should be mentioned. In that case, the notice did identify the mortgagee. It also identified the solicitor purporting to give notice on behalf of the mortgagee but the mortgagee solicitor forgot to personally endorse the notice. The Court of Appeal uh, reversed Mr. Justice Grange in holding that per personal authentication of the notice of sale is required, and uh, accordingly the notice uh, in that regard was held to be invalid, subject, of course, to the curative powers of Section 35. Now, I think uh, in a previous lecture, uh, the, uh, it was stated that the mortgagee must in the notice indicate whether he is proceeding under the power of sale contained in his mortgage or the statutory power of sale contained in Part 2. If you look at the standard printed form, you'll note that these alternatives are set out as options and it's incumbent upon the mortgagee solicitor to delete one or the other. Uh, the issue that arises then is uh, whether the failure to delete, generally that, that portion con uh, concerned with Part 2, uh, invalidates the notice, and I believe uh, the case of Scholard Investments was referred to, and in that case it held the failure to delete one or other of the options did not hold the notice invalid. I must say, although I won't state the reasons uh, right here, that I disagree with that decision, and so does Madam Justice Van Camp, because in Reed, Comrie, Lundberg, and Tomlinson Construction Services, she held that the failure to delete one or other of the options uh, rendered the notice confusing on its face, and accordingly the notice was invalid. Finally, the notice must specify the date the notice is given, of course, and the date after which the property will be sold in the event of non-redemption. It is clear that the redemption period uh, contained in the notice of sale must be at least 35 days in order to comply with Part 3, or 45 days in order to comply with Part 2 of the Act. In Rhee, O'Fee, and Murray Duff, uh, the Court held that the requirement of at least 35 days notice meant clear days exclusive of the first and exclusive of the last. In that case, the notice was issued on January 4th uh, and provided for a sale after February 8th. The number of days excluding the 4th and the 8th is 34. The court held that was, that, that was not sufficient. Accordingly, the notice was invalid. Well, when one's faced with certain defects in the notice of sale, uh, the ultimate question is whether it is or is not invalid. And I uh, can assure you it's difficult to draw any specific principles which might be applied to a given notice of sale in order to make that determination. It uh, should be remembered, of course, that because the procedure is extrajudicial, that the protection of the parties who are receiving the notice, notice is of ultimate concern to the court. I think if the legislature had the same concern in mind, they might have required Form 1 to contain a notice to the parties receiving it that there is an option under Section 21 to pay the monies into court. Uh, the notice, I feel, is slightly misleading in that it sets out the amount required to redeem an unknowledgeable party then receiving it wouldn't uh, be aware that he has the right to only pay the arrears in accordance with the Mortgages Act. That uh, in order to protect those parties, maybe that should be set out in the notice. In any event, in determining whether a notice is or is not invalid, the court should and usually do first have regard to the provisions of Section 27, subsection D of the Interpretations Act. That uh, section or subsection provides that where a form is prescribed, deviation therefrom not affecting the substance or calculated to mislead, do not vitiate it. It may be simplistic to say, but if the defect is one which in the court's opinion could mislead or confuse the party receiving it as to any of the specific information required to be given, to the, given in the notice, so as to possibly prejudice the party receiving it, the notice will held, be held to be invalid. And this will be so notwithstanding the uh, additional knowledge of the party receiving it because the courts have held that extrinsic evidence will not be introduced in order to validate the notice. The notice must be sufficient in and of itself and uh, that is cited in Reese, Alcissi and Reed and approved by the Court of Appeal in Bodiak and Collison. 
quite briefly i may state that there are curative provisions in addition to twenty seven d and of course the uh, the ultimate provision is section thirty five which states that where a notice of sale has been given in professed compliance with part three the title of the purchaser to the mortgage lands cannot be impeached on the grounds that the provisions of part three have not been complied with now there are there are three rather stringent qualifications upon the application of section thirty five the force is of course the first is, is of course the requirement of professed compliance i think it's been stated that in hyde and besser where the mortgagee failed to serve an execution credit with notice of sale uh, that execution creditor being entitled to receive the notice, it was held that there was not professed compliance, and therefore the purchaser could not obtain title free and clear of the execution creditor's interest. A second limitation on uh, the application of Section thir uh, 35 is that the purchaser must be in receipt of a conveyance. The entitlement documents need not be registered. However, an agreement of purchase and sale itself will not be sufficient so as to allow a purchaser to rely on the curative provisions of Section 35. Finally, the third limitation uh, is that stated in Bodiak and Carlson, that if the purchaser has actual or constructive notice of the defect in the notice, the notice of sale, uh, the, sorry, the purchaser will not be able to rely on Section 35. Now, it's obviously incumbent when acting for a purchaser that you review the notice to make sure that all the parties have been served, uh, given Hyde and Besser. Having done that, I think you have, or your client will have, at least constructive notice of any other defect which may be apparent on the face of the notice. I think, therefore, Section 35 may be limited to those cases where the defects aren't apparent on the face of the notice. And I think those defects are those such as where the amount claimed is incorrect or where uh, an interested party wasn't served at the proper address, uh, these type of things where a purchaser solicitor wouldn't know of the defect just by virtue of reviewing the notice of sale. In discussing persons to be served, uh, the provision that uh, discusses that is Section 30, Subsection 1 of the Mortgages Act, which sets out four categories of person to be served with notice of sale. The first category of persons to be served consists of persons appearing by the title register where the property is in land titles, or the abstract book where the property is in uh, the regist registered under the Registry Act to have an interest in the mortgage property. Now, I refer you to subsection 2 of section 30, uh, which Jerry Udell referred to, which defines register of title and abstract index to include instruments received for registration before 4.30 p.m. on the day immediately prior to the day you issue your notice. It's therefore incumbent upon you to do your search uh, or update your search as of 4.30 the day before you issue your notice of sale. If your practice is to issue a demand letter, uh, I think the best procedure is probably to obtain your subset, subsearch during the demand period, review it, and then simply on the day you're issuing your notice of sale, just, tain, just obtain a quick update. The second category of persons to be served are persons who have filed writs of execution either in land titles or with the sheriff. Now, notwithstanding what's been said previously, it's my opinion that uh, the act does not contain a cutoff period of 4.30 p.m. of the day before the notice is issued. However, the case of Remora and Alo indicates that execution creditors who who have not filed before the giving of the notice uh, are not entitled to notice of sale. And that would, although notwithstanding the practical difficulty, seem to suggest that uh, if the giving of the notice is the, is the point in time where the notices are registered, that if an execution creditor files his execution between 4.30 of the previous day and the time the notice is given, he may be entitled to interest or to, to notice. I'm sorry. The Crown or other public authority claiming a lien against the mortgage property uh, should be served where notice of the lien has been uh, given in writing uh, to the mortgagee. Again, there is no cutoff period as, as to when that notice must be given, but it's clear that it sh must be given before uh, the giving of notice of sale. The final category of persons entitled to receive notice under the Mortgages Act are all persons having an interest in the mortgage property where they have given written notice of their interest to the mortgagee uh, prior to the issuance of the notice of sale. It is often the case when a mortgagee issues a notice of sale that he does not confer with his client uh, so as to ensure that they haven't received uh, any written notice. Uh, I think that is something we all should do so as to ensure that when your mortgagee conveys uh, that these parties have been served and accordingly the mortgagee can convey title free and clear of these uh, unregistered in interests. 
having ref reviewed the requirements of the Mortgages Act insofar as parties to be served, I should state that there are a few qualifications. Clearly, parties who have a prior interest need not be served with notice of sale as uh, the mortgagee will not, having served them, be able to convey clear of their interest as they are not prejudiced uh, by the notice or the uh, exercise of the mortgagee's power of sale. Uh, they need not be served with notice. It's also clear by virtue of subsection 1 of section 30 that those persons subject to whose rights the mortgagee proposes to sell the mortgage property need not be served. Now, I, I have difficulty uh, identifying a circumstance where one would want to sell subject to a subsequent encumbrance, but it's clear by Hyde and Vesser that the failure to do so will mean that the mortgagee will not be able to convey free and clear of subsequent interests. Uh, notwithstanding a subsequent registration, of course, the fact that the notice is served on the uh, subsequent encumbrancer does not uh, mean that the mortgagee mortgage will be able to convey free and clear of that interest because such uh, interests such as condominium liens and mechanics liens, security interests registered under the uh, PPSA may notwithstanding their subsequent, subsequent registration uh, still retain their priority over the mortgage. It's clear that uh, Section 43 of the Family Law Reform Act enlarges the scope of persons to be served with notice of sale. Section 43, subsection 1, entitles the spouse of a mortgagor of a matrimonial home to the same notice that the mortgagor would be entitled to in the event that the mortgagee proceeds to realize upon his security. Because of uh, the requirement of subsection 1 of section 43 and the difficulty of establishing with any certainty the identity of the mortgagor spouse or spouses, it is now established practice to serve the mortgagor, his name spouse, if uh, you are aware of it or if the mortgagee is aware of it, and also the spouse of the mortgagor in quotes. Um, by virtue of example, if John Smith and Mary Smith have become registered owners in 1976 and you're executing your, uh, or issuing your notice of sale in 81, you would serve John Smith, Mary Smith, the spouse of John Smith, and the spouse of Mary, spouse of Mary Smith, so as to ensure that you've covered uh, all the possibilities. Having said that, the failure to serve a spouse of a mortgagor in land titles will mean that the mortgagee solicitor will have to have a declaration stating unequivocally that uh, one of the parties served with the notice of sale was the spouse of the mortgagor at the time the notice of sale was given. Alternatively, he may have to produce a declaration stating that the uh, property was not a matrimonial home within the meaning of the Family Law Reform Act. It's been stated that uh, the case of Re MICC in the Bank of Nova Scotia requires uh, at least 40 days notice in the notice of sale and uh, that there is an, uh, an opposing decision um, by Mr. Justice Steele and Reed Kinross Mortgage Corporation and Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation which states for various reasons that notwithstanding uh, the spousal situation 40 days notice is not required it's still the 35 days required by the Mortgages Act. I think as, as Jerry stated uh, caution dictates that uh, at this stage of the game we still provide the 40 days notice. Under the Condominium Act, it's clear that if the lien has been registered on title, hopefully subsequent to uh, your client's mortgage, that uh, the corporation should be served with notice of sale. If it's a non-residential unit, the lien will be subsequent to your client's mortgage, and therefore the service upon the corporation will ensure the mortgagee's right to sell free and clear of the corporation's interest. Where the unit is a, is a residential unit, uh, the lien may be prior or subsequent to your mortgage depending on whether the corporation has been has complied with the registration and notice provisions of the Condominium Act. Uh, it's likely at the time that you issue your notice you won't know either way uh, whether the corporation has or has not complied and therefore it's simple, simplest just to serve them. Finally with respect uh, to guarantors, I shouldn't say finally because I have one of them two other types of persons to discuss. The issue uh, in some of the cases is whether or not the guarantor of a mortgage debt need be served with notice of sale so as to ensure his liability in the event that uh, the mortgagee wishes to sue after a sale. It's clear that where the, where the guarantor has made a payment on behalf of the principal debtor that uh, he has a charge on the land and therefore should be served with notice of sale. Where no payment has been made, which is the majority of cases, the case of industrial enterprises in Shell Street states that where the guarantee is unconditional, 
and doesn't specifically require notice, the mortgagee need not serve notice of sale on the guarantor in order to ensure his liability. The opposite decision was recent Canadian financial company and first federal construction. However, I understand that that case was reversed last week and I haven't read the particulars of, of the decision. In any event, I think it's distinguishable from the Shell Street case on the basis that the guarantee in that case did not contain an express waiver of notice. It's important to note that the uh, Canadian financial case provided that the guarantee's equitable right of redemption was an interest in the mortgage property within, within the meaning of subsection 1 of section 30. Uh, a similar decision was reached, I believe it was just Thursday, in the case of Barsid Enterprises in Cisnadia, in which County Court Judge Hudson held that the equitable right to redeem of the original mortgagor was an interest in land within the meaning of subsection 1 of, sub sec of section 30, and therefore the failure to serve the original mortgagor with notice of sale precluded the mortgagee from recovering the deficiency uh, after a sale. Now, for a number of reasons, I have difficulty with that decision, and uh, it, let's hope it's appealed so uh, we can get a, a higher court decision. Finally, the uh, Canadian financial case is important from the point of view of its discussion of subsection 2 of section 30. Having in that case found that the guarantor had an interest in the mortgage property, he went on to hold that that interest appeared by the register of title. Now, in that case, the register only showed that, the, that there was a guarantor's clause. It did not show the identity of the guarantor. Mr. Justice Hughes held that subsection 2 of section 30 requires a mortgagee solicitor to pull the instrument and review it in order to identify the guarantor and serve him with notice. That on the basis that register of title is defined in subsection 2 of section 30 includes instruments. Now, that decision uh, is opposite or opposing to the decision of Mr. Justice Eberly in Re Inbrook Properties and J. Frank Iotti Realty Limited. In that case, the issue is whether an assignor of a subsequent mortgage had to be served with notice of sale. The uh, abstract book indicated only an abs what appeared to be an absolute assignment and was only upon reviewing the instrument itself that one could have noted that the uh, assignment was merely security for a loan and upon repayment of the loan, the uh, mortgage would have been reassigned back to the assignor. Mr. Justice Everly held that subsection 2 of section 30 does not require uh, the solicitor to review the instrument and accordingly the assigner need not be served. Where your client has received notice in writing of the bankruptcy of the mortgagor or where that notice is registered on title, uh, the mortgagee should serve notice of sale on the trustee. That's clear by virtue of the provisions of the Bankruptcy Act, which provides that upon an assignment or receiving order being made, uh, the property vests in the trustee. Finally, where you serve notice of sale on an individual who is, holds his interest in the land in a capacity as trustee executor of the estate, the service upon that individual in his personal capacity will be sufficient. Uh, the failure to refer to the capacity in which he holds his interest will not invalidate the mortgage or the notice. That by virtue of the two cases I've cited in my paper, Kenny and Barnard and Royal Trust and Roughly. Uh, I leave it to you to review the rest of my paper uh, concerning the other aspects discussed in it. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. There's also a good section there on a subject dear to our hearts, and that's costs. I'd like to call upon uh, Sid Vallow, and Sid will be speaking to you on the subject of possession. Sid is a partner in the Pallet Vallow firm. It's a firm of nine lawyers in general practice in Mississauga. Ken uh, Yolis is an associate, as you know. Sid holds the degrees not only of Bachelor of Arts from UWO and Bachelor of Laws from the University of Toronto, but also a Master of Laws from Osgoode Hall Law School. His practice is primarily mortgage remedies and real estate, and he's been practicing in Mississauga since 1973. Thank you very much. Would you come forward, please, Sid?
I uh, make two brief comments. One, uh, in appreciation to Ken for not mentioning that the Pretis case that uh, we got pasted on was a power of sale that I issued. But uh, we had been arguing with our uh, mortgagee institution for some time that power of sale must specify in the interest a breakout of, of the disbursements that have been made. Secondly, I appreciate the, the time taken, so that leaves me with less, less time to fill. Two comments about how I, how I propose to proceed. In response to the Globe and Mail, who refers to us as uh, holding this in our usual spirit of uh, friendliness and sensitivity, the Law Society is offering its members a night course on how to repossess and sell the homes of people who default on their mortgages. <laughs> I intend to, uh, to try somehow to uh, uh, give you uh, some thoughts on how you can, in a friendly and sensitive manner, repossess those homes. <laughs> that is to say that if, my, uh, if, my, if you read my paper, you will see it outlines defenses that can be taken on behalf of mortgagors. The reality, unfortunately, is that the mortgagor, have, being in default under the mortgage, doesn't always have the kind of funds or uh, resources that will uh, allow him to pursue his remedies. Uh, the reality is also that no mortgagee wants possession of any property. And uh, we are, are finding it more and more difficult uh, as time goes by and rates uh, continue to remain at their levels, arguing these cases in, in the media as opposed to in the courts. Let me then start with respect to the, uh, the right to possession. A mortgage or in a mortgage grants to the mortgagee his legal estate. Based on that, the mortgagee immediately becomes entitled to possession of the property. Under the short form of Mortgages Act, there is a redemise of that legal estate in favor of the mortgagor so long as he is not in default. And based on that provision of the contract, the mortgagor may remain on the land and vis-a-vis -vis the mortgagee, absent default, is not a trespasser, but has a right to possession subsequent to that of the mortgagee. If a mortgagee endeavors to obtain possession of the property before a default, where there is a redemise to the mortgagor, he is going to be subject to damages. After default by the mortgagor, however, a mortgagee need not necessarily make demand. He can enter into possession if he can do so peacefully without demand. A somewhat more esoteric is the situation where a mortgagor or a mortgagee wish to exercise the rights that they have by virtue of possession against third parties, presumably trespassers, people committing waste or damage. Notwithstanding that the mortgagor cannot be a trespasser on his own land, where there is a redemise of possession in the mortgage, if he is to bring an action for trespass or an action based on some violation of the right of possession, there is suggestion that to properly frame that action, he must include the mortgagee, who, being entitled to the first right of possession, the legal estate, should be party to the action so that his rights can't be prejudiced. The mortgagee, on the other hand, must be in possession of the property, either by way of a default and a judgment or default and a peaceful reentry, before he can sue a third party to prevent a trespass, to prevent a damage, to prevent any action that uh, lies in contract or property. There is a suggestion that if he can formulate a tort action, he would be free to sue a third party for damages. The land title system uh, imposes a somewhat different requirement in that it creates a statutory right in the uh, mortgagee to recover the money due by way of entry upon the land. Having the right to take possession the next question is really, what constitutes possession? When do you know that you have possession of the lands? And there appear to be four critical elements. Uh, the cases indicate, and I don't seek or propose 
to give you the case names. I can never remember them. I will attempt to highlight the principles, and you will know where to find the cases. The cases clearly point out that a mortgagee, in order to have possession, must exercise control and management of the property for his own advantage to the exclusion of others. An atonement of rents will, in the circumstances of a subsequent tenant, that is a tenant in possession pursuant to a lease subsequent to the mortgage, constitute an act of possession. The mortgagee collecting the rents has control and management for his own advantage to the exclusion of the landlord. Critical, however, is that the rents be collected in the nature of a mortgagee in possession, as so that the courts have ruled where a mortgagee as a receiver is collecting rents, where a, a mortgagee as party uh, to the a tenancy agreement is collecting the rents, that does not constitute possession, and he cannot simply refer to that collection of rents and say, thereby I have possession. So it is control and management for your own advantage, that is, in your capacity as a mortgagee, not a receiver, not a party to the agreement, to the exclusion of others. If you can demonstrate that, you have possession, and that does not always mean that you must sue and obtain a judgment for possession. How then, if you can't demonstrate peaceful reentry, do you go about obtaining possession? And when I speak of peaceful reentry, I also include, and the cases include, an abandoned property, no one on, the doors are locked, a mortgagee entering by removing the locks and altering them. It constitutes a peaceful reentry. You've got to go back a long way in the case law for the site, but that constitutes a peaceful reentry. However, if you're going to sue for possession, what is it that entitles you to do so? The default of any condition or covenant in the mortgage is going to entitle you to sue for possession. You must make demand and give notice of, of, of the breach, demanding that it be remedied with respect to arrears of insurance, taxes, payments, and having done so, you're free to commence an action for possession with respect to arrears of payments. You must, however, look to your contract, your mortgage document. Generally speaking, it is more prudent for a default that relates to insurance uh, premiums, that relates to taxes, that having made demand that the default be remedied, the taxes be paid, the insurance premiums be paid, and the action commenced. I would be reluctant to commence an action uh, for possession or to, uh, uh, to pursue the remedies contained in the mortgage where my mortgage was in good standing in, in terms of the mortgage payments, uh, but I knew that the insurance had been canceled or that the taxes uh, for the previous years were outstanding and I had not paid them. I suggest that may not be sufficient default. Interestingly enough, and different from any other action for the possession of land, the jurisdiction in which you may bring your action, so long as it is based in mortgage law, is the jurisdiction of your cho choosing. The rules normally provide that an action for possession of land or relating to land must take place in the jurisdiction where the land is situate. And this offers some relief if you're attempting to uh, bring an action for possession on land in uh, St. Catharines and you uh, are in the Peel jurisdiction, in Toronto jurisdiction. So long as your action is framed and based on mortgage, you may issue your writ in Toronto in any jurisdiction, not necessarily that of the land. In terms of who must uh, be the defendant to your action for possession, uh, certainly your defendant must be the owner of the lands. And certainly the uh, defendant must, where the owner is not in possession of the lands, be the party in actual possession of the lands against whom uh, you seek to obtain possession or from whom. They need not, however, at the present time, the case law changing daily, they need not, however, all be defendants to the same action. 
and I suggest in my paper that where you have a mortgagor that is gone, you can't locate them, and you have tenants whom you do know and are in possession, you may sue the tenants and obtain judgment. On the other hand, where you know where your mortgagor is, but you can't find out who it is that's living there, although you know it's a tenant, you can sue for and obtain judgment for possession against the mortgagor and exercise that judgment against the tenant. But it must be done carefully, and I'll come back to that. The claim for possession is normally coupled with a claim for a judgment on the covenant, and it is a, a claim issued under Rule uh, 33 of the, pract of the Rules of Practice. Especially endorsed writs, as you all know, are a very particular proceeding. You have to be careful in how you frame it if you want your summary judgment. And it therefore becomes important to provide in your endorsement on the writ full details of the mortgage and any amending extension agreements, the date and the nature of the default, a calculation of the arrears such that the mortgagor would have an opportunity to stay your proceedings by payment. You must where appropriate, claim for acceleration of the principal amount. You must provide a legal description of the lands so that your ultimate writ of eviction may contain that description. And the courts will check when preparing the writ of eviction. And I refer to a writ of eviction so as not to confuse a writ claiming possession with a writ of possession. The courts will check to ensure the legal description in your writ of eviction precisely matches that in the order. Uh, or the judgment for possession. And you must name the persons in actual occupancy of the land, that being important for the purposes of an owner who is not in possession and tenants that you are suing. Who are these people on defending, uh, defendants to your action? Well, in your endorsement, they are the people in possession of the lands, not necessarily the owner. And finally, please ensure that you claim for possession of the lands. Uh, Ritz claiming a judgment uh, on the covenant and possession have uh, quite often run their course only to discover that you're entitled to judgment on the covenant, but you've forgotten to claim possession. Having issued your writ claiming possession, what defenses are available to the mortgagor? This is the friendly and sensitive part. How do you as a mortgagor prevent somebody from getting possession of your land? Tough row to hoe. You either are in arrears or you're not in arrears. And if you are in arrears and have made default, the fact that you're going to argue about how much the arrears are will not necessarily prevent a mortgagee from signing judgment for possession. The fact that you are not in arrears and an affidavit of merits attesting uh, to that and, that and evidencing some possible tribal issue on that score will prevent a judgment from possession being issued. The other remedy available to you is pursuant to Section 21 of the Mortgages Act, where you bring an application, and in certain circumstances, upon uh, payment into court, the proceedings will be stayed. From the mortgagee, insensitive as he may be, point of view, if you feel that there may be some argument about the amount of arrears, uh, then it may be prudent, if you are sincerely after possession, for whatever reason, to sue for possession only in which event you restrict the issue that may arise in an affidavit of merits to the question of default only. The difficulty being that when you cross-examine and then you appear to move for judgment for possession on the basis that any issue uh, revealed by the affidavit relates only to the amount, not necessarily the default, the courts are want, and I make no comment on the propriety, are want to defend uh, the mortgagor's right. Let's say you've been successful and you've obtained your uh, judgment for uh, possession. Uh, by way of comment, and uh, I support Jerry Udell's uh, comment, the precedents in the materials are very good. I refer you to N33-4143, which are precedents for all of this, your claim properly endorsed, your uh, judgments, your affidavits, and support. You now have judgment for possession. How do you go about exercising it? The rules are quite clear. You must evidence, ultimately, if you are to obtain a writ of possession, or as I say, eviction, you must 
evidence that the parties entitled to possession have had notice. The practice, therefore, is to prepare and forward a notice of judgment for possession that says, take notice, I've got judgment for possession, I require that you vacate by a certain date. And having done that, you must apply to the court for a specific order for leave to issue a writ of possession, eviction as I call it. And on that application, you must demonstrate that you obtain judgment, that you've given notice, or that the parties have notice. That is to say, you could argue that uh, the serving of the writ and the signing of judgment was notice to the parties. It is more prudent to send a demand for possession. That the parties have notice. That is, all the parties entitled to possession have notice. And it is at this point that having served the owners only, you must show evidence that you have given the tenants notice of your judgment for possession and thereby allow them an opportunity, pursuant to the rules, to apply to the court for a stay. And if you can satisfy the court that everybody has had the notice and that nobody has brought an application and that you know they are still in possession, notwithstanding, the court will order a writ of, eviction, a writ of possession eviction to issue. Now, there's been some recent uh, case law over the question of whether or not it's appropriate to serve an owner only when you know there are tenants but don't know who they are, or a tenant only when you know there's an owner but don't know where he is. Uh, the recent decision of uh, Kinross and Balfour, which uh, I refer to at page G17, I believe, gives some of us the shutters. Mortgagee sues the owners, husband and wife. Husband isn't around, he's long gone, and uh, they serve wife and sign judgment for possession against the wife, presumably on the covenant to apply to the courts after the appropriate notice for an order to evict. And Master Sandler points out, and Mr. Justice Creever confirms, uh, that he will not issue a writ of or order a writ of eviction to issue against a wife absent service of the claim upon the husband on the basis that under section 22 once a judgment's been obtained and a sale or recovery of possession has taken place the husband who hasn't been party to the proceedings hasn't been served loses any right he has to redeem it's a very strict reading of the law, perhaps appropriate. But the extension of that then is that what about a mortgage mortgagor not in possession, tenant in possession, you've sued and served the tenants, you've sent notices to the mortgagor, is Kinross and Balfour to be extended to say that everybody entitled to possession must be served before you can get rid of possession of eviction against any party to the proceeding. It is not an unusual circumstance to find husband and wife owner and only a wife available for service. It does, however, demonstrate that the courts will, uh, I believe, and again, with some sensitivity and friendliness towards the mortgagor, provide every opportunity for the mortgagor to redeem his, his property right. In terms of the uh, the actual procedure for eviction, the obtaining of possession. The writ of eviction having been obtained pursuant to court order is delivered to the sheriff. The sheriff attends at the premises, posts a notice or gives a notice to the occupant, uh, advising that he will return in X number of days and the premises to be vacant or he will evict. Uh, the mortgagee's obligation is then to advise the sheriff, uh, generally on the day prior, Sheriffs in different jurisdictions have different uh, procedures, but generally on the day prior that the premises are still occupied, he will require the sheriff's services to evict, and on the date set for eviction to appear at the premises to accept the transfer of possession and sign for it generally with a locksmith to alter the locks and deal with the pigs or birds or dogs, whatever you find. It's still possible, with the sheriff at the door, to exhibit some friendliness and sensitivity. 
A writ of eviction in the sheriff's hands may be withdrawn and represented at least once. It's been our uh, experience that sheriffs will uh, express some reservation about exercising a writ of eviction that has been withdrawn two or three times on the basis that the writ isn't to be used as a hammer for extracting payment. But it is not unusual to have a mortgagor with his three children lined up and his pets and some money to make good the arrears. What always and never ceases to amaze me is that uh, to that point in time, he's never tendered any part payment, contacted you with respect to uh, making arrangements or whatever. This is the first he heard of it. But it is possible, and you should be aware, subject to your client's instructions, to take a part payment and make arrangements for the balance to be paid or the writ to be exercised. I say it is possible to the extent that the propriety, uh, as I'm aware of, has yet to be challenged. Next week it may not be possible to exercise that sensitivity. My paper goes on at, uh, at pages G17 uh, to deal in some detail uh, with respect to the tenant's defenses. Now basically a tenant has the defense of a prior lease. My lease is, is prior to, you, to your mortgage, you have notice of it, and therefore my only obligation is to pay you rent. I can stay in possession. Uh, the tenant with a subsequent lease has no defense unless, and it has been suggested by the courts with respect to residential premises, the mortgagee seeks to atone rents and to do other things that evidence a landlord and tenant relationship. And having done that, creates for himself the difficulty of ultimately obtaining possession under the terms of the Landlord and Tenant Act. So if you are acting for a mortgagee and he's going to require possession of a property that is currently tenanted, your difficulty is the following. Mortgagee may want to sell the property someday, and he may, subject to market conditions, feel that the saleability is affected with someone in possession, and uh, really this is a property for an owner-occupier to purchase, so therefore he must have vacant possession. And yet, if it is a subsequent lease, and he would, under other circumstances, have the right to dispossess the tenant, if he collects rents from the tenant, he leaves himself open to the defense that it's a landlord-tenant relationship, he must proceed under that act, which creates significant difficulties in obtaining possession. So his only alternative is not to atone rents and to vacate the property, which then comes in conflict with his obligation to maintain the property and uh, rents as best he can and may enforce on him an obligation to pay occupancy rent. Commercial tenancies uh, create a, a less of a problem, I suggest, because you can at least proceed under the residential, under the, uh, the old Landlord and Tenant Act. There is one other suggestion that has been made recently and bears some, some thought, and that is if you do have a lease prior, to, uh, your mortgage is prior to lease, and therefore have the prior right, consider a torning, re-entering into possession, exercising that right of the mortgagee, with an offer to let on specific terms including notice. Clearly in a commercial tenancy that's not a bad way to proceed. Protect yourself from uh, perhaps the argument that you have uh, accepted the uh, landlord's lease and you are now tied into that or if it's a yearly lease that you cannot evict for a year. Serve notice to a torn. We are prepared however to uh, leave you in possession if you will pay rent on a monthly basis and accept a monthly tenancy. The courts will, and I detail in my paper, look to very specific matters in, in, in deciding whether or not you are a landlord. Mortgagee in possession is a landlord. Have you collected rents? Have you acted like a landlord? And so on. Dealing then at 22 with the rights of the mortgagee in possession, very specific rights that have been dealt with by the courts through the ages. Firstly, Mortgagee, having gone into possession, is entitled to rents and profits. Again, taking the predominant case where 
a redemise of the legal estate resides in the mortgagor. Default having occurred, mortgagee goes into possession. His possession and right to possession arose on the default, and therefore his atonement of rent and entitlement to rent and profit will relate back to all rent unpaid and owing from the date of default forward. Absent a redemise, which I should suggest uh, by virtue of the Short Form Mortgages Act is not a common occurrence, but absent a redemise, his entitlement was always to possession, and he therefore is entitled to all the rent owing and due, notwithstanding the default. Falkenbridge suggests, and I point out, that where there is a redemise, and his entitlement to rent runs from the date of default, and in fact he collects rent from before the date of default, there is the difficulty of apportioning that rent. Mortgagee in possession has the right to lease the lands. Reasonable way to deal with them, maintain the profit from the land, keep your mortgage outstanding. But for how long? Uh, there is some suggestion that you can't lease beyond the term of your mortgage. On the other hand, I refer you to the case Christian and Noble cited where the court held that you could lease beyond the term of your mortgage. A difficult circumstance where you propose to remain in possession and attempt to lease the property, collect the rents, and account for them. Mortgagee in possession has the right to reimbursement for his expenses. He may expend amounts in the management and preservation of the property and add the cost of doing so to his principal. He can add the cost of managing the property to his principal unless it is a cost that he imposes by virtue of his own management. No argument about hiring an outside manager to run the property at reasonable cost. Uh, caution, you must e exert some uh, influence on your mortgagee in ensuring that the costs he expends are reasonable. A court will not allow the property be to be improved beyond the, uh, at a cost that exceeds the value of the improvement. A court will generally not allow a property be to be improved to the extent it can no longer be redeemed, that is, beyond redemption by the mortgagor. And I refer you to a specific case in my notes where a mortgagee going into possession attempted to run the business that existed on the premises that were mortgaged and the court held not possible. Your mortgage must specifically give you that right. Mortgagee has the right to sell. Well, that's primarily what we're talking about here today. Conveyancing point, you've exercised your rights, you're attending on closing. How is it that you propose to deliver the possession that you have? Uh, we have certainly received requisitions from purchasers. Please give us a judgment for possession, evidencing your possession of this property. I suggest that de facto possession, peaceable entry, you are in possession, you have the locks to the property, is good enough. You need not have a judgment for possession to demonstrate that you are in possession and able to give over possession of the property. One caution, however, and I haven't the answer. What about vacant land, unfenced vacant land? Having gone through the entire proceedings, how do you respond to the requisition, please give me evidence that you are in possession of these vacant lands? And I suggest in that case, to be perfectly careful, you might, might wish to have obtained a judgment for possession in the absence of the lands being fenced and being able to demonstrate dominance and control to the exclusion of others. What about the obligees, obligations of the mortgagee in possession? Mortgagee certainly has an obligation to account. He must manage prudently and account for that management. And this raises a critical issue. Your mortgagee can't simply run in and take possession of the property and start to manage it. He may find himself in possession of a de deteriorating property with some obligation to maintain it, and yet the expense will never be recoverable. So it's not always a question of just taking possession. You must look at your property and determine whether or not the maintenance of that property is going to render you uh, subject to an even greater deficiency. If he is receiving rents, the application of the rentals normally, first to the payment of the current expense, secondly to the interest arrears, thirdly in reduction of the expenses that have been added to the capital of the mortgage, and fourthly in payment of the principal amount. A mortgagee may be obliged to pay occupation rent. My point about vacating a unit because you ultimately have to sell it, but there is a procedure for a master to order payment of occupation rent. 
you have violated your obligation to maintain the property and continue to receive the rentals and account for them, or you may have violated them. There is an obligation on the mortgagee to maintain the property, and I have already expressed to you the concerns that he would have in terms of how much he can expend, whether he can improve the property, and there is a distinction between maintenance and improvement. Generally speaking, however, he won't be responsible for deterioration unless he has been gross, grossly or willfully negligent. Mortgagee is responsible for damages for having taken possession improperly, and a mortgagee in possession will also be responsible for common expenses in hydro, and Paul Mazza will deal with those matters. Quickly then, with respect to the topic of insurance and mortgage insurers. We all know when you put a mortgage on title, you ensure that the mortgagee is an endorsee on the insurance policy, naming the insured owner and the mortgagee as being the payees of proceeds. Having gone into possession, you make the assumption that the old policy is still in effect. Not always a reasonable presumption. The presumption is based on the fact that you must, under the Insurance Act, be given notice of a cancellation or failure to pay premium resulting in cancellation. Better procedure, and many institutional lenders have this master policy in effect to cover all properties in possession from the time until. Keep in mind, if you've taken possession of a property that remains vacant, that vacancy, absent notice to the insurance company and perhaps payment of an additional premium, may nullify the insurance. And finally, concern yourself with the question of whether or not the mortgagee having taken possession of the property with the swimming pool in the backyard and the fence that's fallen down is going to be subject to some occupier's liability in the event of an accident. And my, my paper refers you to the Occupier's Liability Act, which is a new statute in Ontario. What happens when the property burns down, gets blown over, blown up, and the insurance proceeds are paid? Generally speaking, the mortgagee has three alternatives. He can agree to have the funds expended in repair of the property, and the property remains a security for his debt. He can take the lump sum payment to the extent of his debt and hold it as security for payment, keeping the mortgage outstanding. Or he may take that lump sum and satisfy the mortgage installments as they fall due. He may not absent a provision in the mortgage, apply the proceeds in reduction of the principal amount without the mortgagor's consent. But where the mortgage provides that insurance proceeds can be used to reduce the principal outstanding, he may do so. And finally, with respect to mortgage insurers, more and more mortgages today insured by the private uh, insurers. That is, in addition to CMHC, MICC, Sovereign, etc. They all have very specific policies and manuals and guidelines, which seem to be changed monthly, that they will require you implement on behalf of your client in order to maintain the insurance in effect. And I suggest that if you do not, and you do act for, if you act for institutions and you do not have a copy of those relevant portions of the, of the guidelines, you obtain them, or you at least advise your, your mortgagee lender to ensure that they comply with them. They deal with the manner in which you may take the possession, the manner in which you secure the property, the ma manner in which you maintain the property, and the manner in which you may sell the property. Above all, when you take possession, and it is we, the lawyers, who take possession on behalf of our clients, exhibit sensitivity, exhibit friendliness. Ultimately, however, you must account to your client for the arrears. And sometimes the only way to obtain those arrears is to dispossess people of their property right. Thank you.